1860 Steinway Square. Um, I have it closed up in this form. It, it has a very boxy, coffin like shape that uh, some people find nerve wracking in the room with them. But it, it's, this is built in Brazilian rosewood veneer. It uh, was built in 1860, the first year of the Civil War, and when the Steinway Company was about seven years old. They were established in 1853. And four Steinway brothers had been uh, piano builders and very uh, interested in piano technology in Europe. And there are a few existing pianos apparently in various places of Steinway instruments built before they came to America. But as they immigrated, they um, came to New York City, split up, and worked for different piano manufacturers at the time. Uh, including, I believe, one of them went to Chickering. And when they first started producing pianos, they were all squares of this type. Uh, they were uh, cast iron framed squares. This one is slightly larger than the very first models. Their very first models were a little bit smaller than that. This, this instrument is about three feet deep by about uh, six and a half feet long, which puts it as a total footprint on the floor of almost exactly twice that of the Babcock. So it is a taller, deeper, bigger, much heavier, um, and has uh, a six and two-thirds octave compass or so, I believe, going from C in the bottom to A at the top, missing uh, a few notes at either end from what the uh, um, well, actually, yes, six and two thirds octaves rather than the seven and a third octaves of the normal modern grand. So that uh, normally you would have three or four more notes down to A here and a few extra notes up to C at the top, three more notes at the top. Um, the Steinway. Uh, Steinway built almost exclusively squares in their first years. They, uh, even up as late as 1870, the estimates I've had heard are that they produced 96 or 97 percent squares to about 3 percent grands. And my understanding is that it wasn't until after 1860 that they really started experimenting with grands, patented the idea of cross stringing to go with a grand string layout and developed essentially the modern pian grand piano in stages over about the next 20 years after this instrument was built. But their first patent for cross stringing was actually for squares and this incorporates that technology. It has a, a heavy cast iron string plate, uh, light by today's standards, but uh, it has two separate, a bass bridge and a tenor bridge at the same level that uh, hold the single wound strings on a bass bridge, double wound, copper wound strings on a tenor bridge that uh, are at a crossed angle to the longer treble strings and that allowed them to pack much more massive strings and longer strings that still retain good anharmonicity in a case that is not as large as it would need to be to accommodate um, a straight strung piano. Uh, it inverts from the Babcock direction, uh, puts tuning pins towards the back of the instrument and hitch pins off to the right where the Babcock would reverse that. 
it still has the hammers in a arc as required by almost all square designs with the hammers twisted so that they're aligned with the strings and this one has a nice um, black string black and gilt string plate on the right with a strong dividing line where, where the, in the pin area it goes into the more normal uh, bronzing powder gilt string plate that became the standard for most Steinway pianos later. Um, this uh, decoratively painted black is, is something I've not seen on very... it was common enough but it's not was not the standard even then and they had different detailing varieties. The um, sound of this piano is it was designed as a domestic piano to be played in the home and so it was definitely the business that Steinway was trying to get into early. Only later did they really uh, establish their reputation on the concert stage with large grants. So this sound is not as powerful as the later evolution of the piano led to, especially in the treble, but it is starting to get, especially in the bass, a deeper, stronger voice and it is substantially larger. A quick estimate would be that the keys on this instrument dip the full 0.38 to 0.4 inches that a modern piano would dip. So the energy to drive one of these hammers, which weighs nearly as much as on a modern grand, would be probably five times the energy that one could put into a small hammer of the Babcock, where you're pushing much less resistance over much less distance. And here the, the force of a finger striking this hammer, the key over that longer distance means it's a big, a much deeper feel, much more energy going into the hammers, and with that much more energy sound than in the Babcock. Uh, really hard to quantify without instruments how much more, but much more than double the sound coming out of it. Um, this particular instrument came to me in very rough shape. Uh, the case, Brazilian rosewood is one of the most beautiful furniture woods in my opinion ever created. It uh, is very hard and it resists damage and dings better than most veneer woods, much harder than mahogany. Uh, but the original shellac on this had peeled off so completely that I wasn't sure what the wood was when I first saw it. Uh, it was almost uh, impossible to see, uh, but it was such a well-built instrument that it cleaned up and restored re really nicely, both in terms of furniture, and then this has been carefully restrung back to the original specifications. The hammers were badly worn and extreme, extremely hard felt on this initially and did not sound good. So uh, it's just recently been reworked with new hammer felt uh, installed on the existing hammer moldings that were original to the piano. And um, it has uh, the dampers are contained in a fairly large pivoted frame. Uh, because they had much larger strings and much larger hammers that can produce much more sound, to make musical sense of that sound, it's more important that it silence fairly effectively when, uh, when the dampers come down. So much more positive damping, but it does translate into a mechanically much more elaborate frame for holding the dampers and a little extra work in restoration and regulation to get this system to work compared to the smaller damper heads of um, earlier squares like the Babcock. The, um, by the time the piano evolved back to the full modern grand, Steinway still, I think, felt that this, this damper arrangement is almost necessary for squares because of the geometry of the square. The point at which the hammer strikes is right over the key bed, so there's no simple way to put vertical damper wires uh, 
other than in a, some sort of leveraged frame like this. But uh, with the more modern brands, of course, the modern piano actions typically rely on uh, small vertical wire dampers that are uh, perhaps weighted but or sprung, but much more simple in their mechanics th than these for squares. Um, Ralph, what about the action? Okay, I can go there. Uh, the action on this piano is essentially a continued evolution of the same action found in the Babcock. It looks much the same. It's a vertical jack. It has a specific let-off button, which the Babcock does not have. Uh, the Babcock more or less uses the angle of the jack moving to slip off the end of the hammer knuckle. This reaches a, 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 a button and an L-shaped jack that forces the jack to pivot out from underneath the knuckle of the hammer. But it is still essentially the, the German, uh, what the Germans would call the Stoss mechanic, the, the English square action adapted for slightly later American bigger pianos. Uh, there, that means that it has more, it, 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 reputationally it would have more strength and more power than the Viennese action that was competitive at the time. A little less finesse perhaps in, in uh, some Europeans particularly preferred the Viennese action and felt they could gain more control with it. The hammers are larger by far than on the Babcock, but still a little smaller than on a modern Grand. So uh, they have added specific small felt back catches at the ends of the key. So as the key lever rotates forward, it catches the tail of the hammer and ar positively arrests the hammer's recoil. It does not have anything resembling the repetition actions of a modern grand, so it's lacking all of the uh, whip and le repetition lever mechanics of a, a modern grand. Um, uh, why do you suppose, do you have any um, thoughts on why the square piano really maintained so strongly in America where it was abandoned very early in Europe. There's there's this big question also whether the square piano itself as a, a music playing machine was adequate or or whether it was inferior. Yes. Uh, I could muse a lot on those questions and I'm not sure I have any definitive answers. Part of it was America as upwardly mobile and a low growing larger middle class developed somewhat uh, distinctive tastes in the sense that eventually, I think, led in the 1880s to East Lake and Rococo style furniture, the sense that if you're able to afford it, you may as well buy something large and ostentatious. And these pianos were definitely uh, something that someone could say, I'm proud of this and I paid my money for this and this is a good thing to have had. Uh, or it was worth it. I also believe that these were not poor instruments in their design. They were uh, musically really quite good instruments. This is much louder and nice sound than even the Babcock, which is a well-preserved 1830-ish square in the same vein. It is, however, such a complex instrument and many modern piano restorers and technicians don't understand them completely, that it's common to see them bad, so badly rebuilt that they don't play well uh, or not have the invested effort to make them really sound to their potential. Um, also, as the piano evolved later and grands became the standard by which pianos were judged, culminating in what essentially became the modern Steinway or Chickering or uh, Mason Hamlin or Canada Grand, uh, they went to even larger hammers, more string, more notes, 88, so adding the extra six or seven missy notes of this piano, three strings per note through most of the treble as opposed to the two that are on this, uh, much more massive wire, much more massive hammer, and by the time that was incorporated in a square design like this, you would need to come out about six more inches in some cases yeah. deeper uh, and another foot almost in length. Yeah. So these became 
hugely heavy, expensive to manufacture, and because the soundboard is still confined only to the right half of the instrument, less sound and less musically pleasing than a grand of the same footprint. So they, as, as the designs grew and the expectations for more and more sound grew, uh, it also tended to load so many strings on a very short bridge by its design that it would suppress the resonance of the bridge and they did become tonally less, uh, less resonant as they became triple strung and more notes later. And this fairly early Steinway at 1860 I think is kind of in the sweet spot where it still sounds quite nice and has good singing resonance qualities but uh, it lacks the notes that some modern players might expect to find in Compass and it certainly does not project like an, a modern stage concert grand. There's this question of the, this, the tonal characteristic of a square, this vintage or of any vintage, this business about the plinking sound, the very, di it's, it's very characteristic sound of squares. And you hear it in there. Some of that may just be hammer voicing, mm -hmm. but it does seem to be in squares. It also is, I think it's found in two or three aspects of the design that sort of combine to do that. One is that the soundboard has a very long edge where it's free floating, where in a modern grand, the soundboard is held firmly in the rim of the piano, except along the the gap where this hammer strike through in, from below to strike the, the strings. So the soundboard is less rigidly held in a square because it's essentially triangular shape with the long side of the triangle uh, free floating. And so it may not, uh, it has perhaps a slightly lower natural frequency of vibration than a uh, soundboard uh, in a, the treble part of a soundboard in a more modern grand where it's very rigidly held on all sides pretty much by the case in the bent side of the piano. And so that would mean that the soundboard is probably slightly less responsive to treble uh, at treble sound and in a sense that it is more flexible and therefore drains sound from the strings more quickly so that the decay is more pronounced. So it, there's the initial attack and then a, a, a quick draining of the energy with just a little bit of residual singing. And partly because of where it's positioned on the soundboard, the bass bridge is in the corner where it's most reinforced and because of the physics of lower frequency vibration, uh, this, this string will have two, four, three octaves, so three doublings, will go through, if this, if this G and this G were uh, able to be sustained for the same number of vibrations, this one would la have eight times the sustain of this one. So you hear fairly quick decay and a long sustain and that's essentially a characteristic nature of a vibrating system is that it will go through a certain number of vibrations before the sound decays away but at a higher frequency it means it's much quicker time. That it, so you get a, a quarter second of real decay where here you might be getting two to three seconds before you're at half the initial volume. Is, is that. So that's part of my thinking is that, and many piano makers, modern of all types, emphasize the rigidity of their rims and the frame, the, the Steinway particularly molds these laminated bent side frames that are extremely rigid and focus on that as important to the sound and it probably is because it anchors the soundboard so firmly that it it becomes uh, a resonator that allows them to balance uh, the decay uh, from the treble to bass uh, 
to more of the modern standard than these squares would, would have done. It. They, they particularly try to enhance the ringing and the treble. They do that with undanced sections of string and aliquot bridges and their du famous duplex and triplex scales that they added later, all to give more stored energy in the treble particularly so that the ringing lasts longer in the treble. And so this de quick decay may actually be distinctive for almost all early pianos and that many of the later Steinway inventions that have since been used by Yamaha and everyone else who's followed them uh, are specific tricks to try to create longer lived treble sound.